All right, so the clock has struck seven o'clock. So I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you um, for coming tonight to uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society Press's Book Bites event. Uh, special May 5th edition, Cinco de Mayo, if you're tuning in. Uh, you know, we only have 15, 20 minutes together today, so I probably won't be able to get into a whole discussion on the history of Cinco de Mayo. But if you're really interested, we can we can save some time at the end to talk about the complicated relationships that uh, people of Mexican descent have with this holiday here in the United States. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all here today. My name is Sergio Gonzalez. I am an assistant professor of Latinx studies at Marquette University uh, in Milwaukee, and I am also the author of Mexicans in Wisconsin, uh, which is, I guess, the reason that I'm here with you all here tonight to talk a little bit about this wonderful book that I had the chance to write um, through the Wisconsin Historical Society Press published in 2017. Um, these, uh, these book events are kind of an opportunity for authors to share a little bit of their research, a little bit of their work, um, why they do what they do. Uh, but since we only have 20 minutes together, there's absolutely no way that we can cover everything that's in there. And so this is my uh, soft plug at the beginning of our time together that if any of this is interesting to you, uh, go to your local bookseller and get yourself a copy of the book. And that book in itself, Mexicans in Wisconsin, a, an edition within the People of Wisconsin series, is just a primer. It's just an introduction into uh, so many different histories of people of Mexican descent who have uh, over 100 years come to the state um, and found a way to make it home. So, um, you know, when I, when I do library talks across the state, um, I usually get about 50 minutes um, to dig into over 100 years of history. And so obviously we don't have that time. So what I wanna do is, is to do a few things tonight. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the origin story. I'm always interested as an academic when I talk with graduate students and undergraduates and other professors, you know, why do you study what you study? Why have you committed your life uh, to interrogating the questions that you're really interested in? Um, and so I'll, still, uh, I'll share a little bit at the beginning here of, of why I decided to write this book. And then um, the last 15, 20 minutes that we have together, I will kind of run us through a very brief um, history of our uh, set of histories of Mexicans in Wisconsin. And I'd invite everyone to, to use the, uh, the chat uh, to throw any questions that you have. Um, and uh, Kristen, who, Kristen Gilpatrick, who is our press's uh, fantastic publicity uh, extraordinaire, uh, will be jumping in if you have questions to kind of uh, prompt me to answer them since I can't see them. So please do not hesitate to throw your questions in the chat. All right, so let's start with this question. Why? Why did I decide uh, to write this book? Um, I wrote this book when I was in graduate school. I was uh, working on my PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, and I had this opportunity when I was right in the middle of working on this, uh, what ended up being a 500-page dissertation, to take a little bit of a breather um, and to work on something that was not so academically heady. Um, it was this really great opportunity to take all this research that I've been working on for years and to kind of put it into a format that's more accessible uh, to a larger community. So why was I studying when I was writing this book in 2015, 16, 17? Why was I studying the history of Latinos in Wisconsin? Well, uh, before I went back to graduate school, I was a middle school teacher and I knew that when I was gonna go back to get my, my master's and my PhD in history, I wanted to study something that, that had uh, some sort of, um, importance to me, right? That it had some sort of connection to who I was and where I came from. Um, and so uh, my family, uh, both my parents are originally from Jalisco, Mexico, uh, first generation Mexican American, born and raised here in Milwaukee. But, you know, I, um, when I went to graduate school, and I started thinking about what is the history of Latinos or Latinx people in, in the United States, oftentimes, uh, the conversations about Latinx people um, started and ended with this image, right? So I want you to put yourself back kind of in uh, 2012, 2013, the middle of the Obama administration as uh, deportations were rising every single day. Of course, uh, that the president, the former president, President Obama earned himself the moniker of the deporter in chief for the number of deportations executed under his administration. And oftentimes in our public rhetoric, when we talked about immigration specifically from Latin America and specifically from Mexico, um, the conversation started here. And unfortunately, it, it ended here as well. And of course, under our, our last president uh, from 2016 to 2020, the Borderlands region uh, kind of functioned as, as a, a totem to, to really 
uh, suck up all of the conversation about questions of migrations and, 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 and refugees and, and how people from Latin America came to this country um, and found a way to make it home. Now, the reality is um, this region doesn't really mean much to me personally. Um, I was born in Milwaukee, was raised in Wisconsin, I've only been to the border once or twice in my life. And so the histories that had been written over so many years about people of Latino and Latinx descent, specifically people of Mexican descent in, in the United States, those histories focus just too much on this region. And there just wasn't enough that had been told about the history of Latinos in the Midwest. Um, and specifically the history of Latinos in, in my home here in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin. So when I went to graduate school, I started in 2012. I decided my focus is going to be on Latinos in Wisconsin. And most importantly, I want to understand my parents from Jalisco, Mexico, and why their families had decided to settle in this cold, cold place. Why didn't they stay in Los Angeles or in, in Texas or in Arizona or New Mexico? Why did they make the decision to come this far north, right? About, about as far north as you can really go here in the Great Lakes region. Uh, so that was the big question. I still remember my first archival trip that I took as a uh, graduate student. It was the summer of 2013. I was a doe-eyed, bushy-tailed graduate student. Um, I was going to set out to write my master's thesis and I went to the Milwaukee County Historical Society. And I went to the Historical Society and um, I went to the archivist. And I said, um, you know, I'm Sergio Gonzalez, I'm a graduate student, I am going to write the history of Latinos in Wisconsin, kind of, you know, puffed out my chest, I was really excited about this. And I said, I'd like to see everything that the Milwaukee County Historical Society has preserved on the history of Mexicans and Latinos in Milwaukee and across the state. Now, I figured when I made that type of a request to the archivist that, um, you know, I was going to get a long list of things to look at, that I was going to be spending perhaps my entire summer locked in the archives in the beautiful Milwaukee County Historical Society reading room. The archivist, who was very sweet, uh, said, just hold on one second, ran into the back room and came back with a handful of boxes and said, here you go. Here's everything we have. It's like two or three boxes, if I remember correctly. I thought to myself, holy crap, this is going to be the shortest dissertation that's ever been written. If this is it, this is going to be a very short career as an academic. So I was obviously a little bit stunned, a little bit afraid of what I had gotten myself into. But after I'd kind of gotten over that initial shock, I opened up one of the boxes. And in that box, um, I found this document that I want to share with you. All right, so take a look um, at this document here. Uh, if we were together uh, in, in, an, in, in an audience, I'd ask you, what do you see here? Um, and you're welcome to throw it in the chat, but unfortunately I can't see it. So I'm just gonna give away the answers here. So what we have here is um, a Sunday edition of the Milwaukee Journal's magazine called Wisconsin. This came out, uh, this was a Sunday insert that would come out uh, every single week in the Milwaukee Journal. And uh, this is an edition from July of 1987. And so if you're watching here, I want you to take a look at this image that is kind of um, dominates the page here, right? And what you see here um, are, uh, well, it's an interesting image. It was to me as a young researcher, uh, but it was also interesting to me uh, as uh, the baby in the middle of that picture. Uh, that's me. Uh, a young, what was that, four or five months old in my parents' arms, that's my mom and my dad there, uh, in the summer of 1987. So I had this surreal moment where I literally found myself in my research, right, which is like this existential thing that all book writers and academics go through where they're kind of like, you know, what is my position in my research? Well, I'm literally on my first research trip, I am there, right, I'm in it. Um, I got to thinking though, as I put my academic hat back on, and I looked at this picture, what did it mean that the Milwaukee Journal Magazine had noted that this image uh, in the Chiron here at the bottom, this was the pulse of Hispanic Milwaukee. This is the beating heart of the city's Latino or Hispanic community. What does it mean that you have these families on a bright Sunday morning leaving a church? This is Our Lady of Guadalupe on Milwaukee's South Side, Milwaukee's Point neighborhood. What does it mean that this is where the heart of the city's Latino community um, lives? This is where it's from. And it was this kind of uh, meeting of myself in the archives that got me thinking about what I wanted to focus on, right? So now I, I started to kind of funnel in on what my research was going to be as an academic, which was to say, I wanted to understand how religious spaces, places of faith 
have historically been places where Latinos, people of Latinx descent, have turned to, to build community for themselves, right? So it's a place where they have turned inward when they have perhaps faced discrimination, prejudice, recriminations in their lives in Milwaukee or in Wisconsin. So it's a place to turn inward, but also how church spaces have historically also been places to build social movements, to build outward, right? So it's a place where people could turn to when they were feeling like they didn't have a home, they could coalesce, build coalitions, build solidarities, and then turn back to their, to their homes in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to better their lives and better the lives of their families, all right? So it was kind of this one chance encounter on my first Iraq trip that got me going. And so I, you know, throughout graduate school, I read a dissertation and I had a chance to take some of that research and turn it into this book, Mexicans in Wisconsin. And, and this image, again, guided my work as a writer uh, of a popular history, right? Because um, I'm a first generation Mexican American, first generation college student, first in my family to have that opportunity to go to higher education. And um, the one thing that was always very important to me as I was going through graduate school was who's gonna read my work? Is it just gonna be a bunch of other historians? Is it gonna sit on a shelf? Um, is it maybe gonna get plugged in a history class sometime? Um, or are there gonna be people who actually get a chance to engage with this history that I think is so important, right? That I know matters to not only me, but to my family and to the community that I call home here in Milwaukee in the state of Wisconsin. And so it was really the people in this image, uh, my parents, my family, community members, that, were, that was always kind of at the back of my head as I wrote this book, as I took all that research that I was doing, oral histories and, and reading through newspapers and, and tried to make that more digestible for, for a larger community. And in my research, I found a really diverse set of histories. And I always emphasize when I talk with my students and I talk with, with community members that you can't really say that you are talking about the history of Mexicans in Wisconsin. You're talking about a multitude of histories, right? And in reality, the histories that we know are just a window, a small tidbit of so many other histories that have not been told. And I've really uh, been proud of the work the Wisconsin Historical Society Press has been engaged in over the last few years to really expand the number of histories that are made available for our community to engage with, right? So my book, Mexicans in Wisconsin, is kind of that first uh, cobblestone on that, on that larger path, but so many other books, including Somos Latinas, written by um, two great public historians, Tess Arenas and Luisa Gomez, who have been guests of Book Bites here in the past. Um, and I know other books that will come in the future that are gonna help us tell those multiple histories of Latinos and Latinx people in the state of Wisconsin. And the reality is that these histories go back so far in our state's history. Oftentimes when we talk about the history of immigrants and immigrant communities in Wisconsin, we're talking about a very specific set of histories. We're talking about Germans and Poles and Irish and Swedes. And to be honest, that does not encompass, that does not represent the full capacity, the full history or set of histories of immigration to Wisconsin because Mexicans have been in this state um, for over a hundred years. The first reported or person that we have found as historians was this man, this mustachio gentleman that you see right here, Rafael Valles. Rafael Valles originally came from the state of Puebla, Mexico. Uh, and he uh, was a young musician that was classically trained and was a bit of a prodig prodigious talent. And he was recruited to come to the United States uh, because of his abilities as a, as a composer and as a violinist. And he decided to settle here in Milwaukee in the 1880s. He arrived here in 1884. Um, and he really, um, ingrained himself within the larger Milwaukee community, he became a composer, he became uh, the, the, lead uh, the, the lead musician and lead choir director for some of the most important congregations and synagogues in the city of Milwaukee. Um, kind of as a personal uh, interest to me, he became Marquette University's first uh, Latino professor. He became a professor of music at the turn of the century. And he really uh, integrated himself into a larger kind of middle and upper middle class socioeconomic strata here in the city of Milwaukee. Now his story, the story of Rafael Baez, is a story that's very different from the stories of the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Mexican descent people who, have, who came after him in the 20th century and found a home in Wisconsin. But the one thing that I always emphasize that connects Rafael Valles to the people that followed after him, even though he himself never considered himself part of the Mexican community here in Milwaukee, was that he came here for his skills. He came here because of his labor. 
And that for many people of Mexican descent has been the thing that has brought them to the state, right? The work that they can do and then how they can turn that work um, into better opportunities for themselves and their families. Um, Rafael Valles was followed uh, by multiple generations of people from Mexico and from the US-Mexico borderlands that came to Wisconsin uh, throughout the 20th century. So in the 1920s, you had the first arrival of industrial workers here in the city of Milwaukee. These people uh, earned the title of being called Los Primeros, or in Spanish, the first. Um, it began with a handful of, of young men who were recruited to the city of Milwaukee to work in our tanneries, our factories, and our foundries. Um, oftentimes they were recruited as strike breakers. Um, they were not notified before they signed their contracts that they were going to be brought here as scabs to break the city's heavily unionized workforce. Um, but when they arrived in the city, they, they quite often found that their presence in the city was, was not welcome. Their labor was certainly wanted and, and needed by industrialists, but their social presence in the city was not something that was uh, looked forward to by many Milwaukeeans and many Wisconsinites. Uh, those first small groups of, of industrial workers eventually became families, and by the late 1920s, there were uh, two to 5,000 Mexican descent people who called Milwaukee home. And because they couldn't find community in much of the city where they faced discrimination and racism and linguistic um, uh, prejudice, uh, they turned inward and made institutions for themselves. Mutual aid societies like this one, La Sociedad Mutualista Hispano Azteca, which was developed in the late 1920s. They had their own baseball teams like Los Amigos Baseball Club. Uh, and they had their own religious institutions like the Mexican Mission Chapel of Our Lady of Guadalupe which was developed in the Walker's Point neighborhood. Now, these, of course, were not the only people of Mexican descent who made their way to Wisconsin. In the 1940s and 1950s, um, Wisconsin became the home to uh, every single year, anywhere from 10 to 15,000 people from the US-Mexico borderlands. These were American citizens, Texas-born Mexican descent families called Tejanos. And Tejanos came to the state every single year in the post-war years. Um, and they tilled and they harvested every single crop that you can imagine. As Wisconsin became one of the country's bread baskets, um, it was migrant workers from the Texas borderlands uh, that really made the state hum. But unfortunately, they found that, again, even though their work was uh, required, um, it was demanded, it was necessary to make the state's economy float, uh, their social conditions, their living conditions were often uh, pretty destitute, what some state commissions referred to as um, nothing less than hovels. And so in response to this in the 1960s, inspired by migrant farm workers that were organizing in places like California, people might be familiar, of course, with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, um, these migrant farm workers organized themselves into labor unions uh, like Obreros Unidos. And that social activism that began in rural Wisconsin and places like Potoma eventually found their way into Milwaukee as well. And you see here that same church uh, where my family was leaving on that bright summer day in 1987. Here you have people of Mexican and Puerto Rican descent um, organizing themselves in a protest against police brutality on Milwaukee's South Side. And I wanna finish here with this point as we're kind of running close on time. And we'll leave any, any, any time here for questions as they may have popped up in the chat for today. Um, one of the things that I have found in my work, I think a unifying thread, if there are any unifying threads, is, is one is this question of, of labor and of need, um, the way in which people of Mexican descent have been seen in Wisconsin um, as what historian May Nye refers to as impossible subjects, people whose uh, work is needed, whose physical presence in the state is obvious, uh, but whose uh, social uh, welcoming has often been non-existent. And so that question of, of hospitality, the way in which Wisconsinites have extended an opening hand at times and at times pulled that hand back is kind of a unifying question that I'm really interested in as a scholar. Um, but I'm also interested in the way in which people of Mexican and Latino descent, regardless of the welcome they've received in the state, have found ways to make home for themselves in, in, in Wisconsin and places like Milwaukee, um, and have said with a full-throated voice that they are Wisconsinites as well, and that they represent the state as much as anyone else. Um, because of their physical presence, because of the labor they produce, because of their basic human dignity, but also because they've been here for over 100 years. So that's the that's kind of the gist of the uh, of, of the book. And I will just again softly plug, I'm, I'm a terrible bookseller, but I'll just say that 
If you're interested in reading more about these histories, please go to your local bookseller and get yourself a copy of Mexicans in Wisconsin. Go to the library if, if, if you're interested and get yourself a copy of Mexicans in Wisconsin. I'm gonna to turn to Kristen and see if we had any, any questions. Thank you, sir. She has a question from Dean. He says, uh, thank you for writing your very important book. How has treatment of slash opportunities for Latinos in Wisconsin changed over the past 10 to 20 years? And did the immigration rhetoric during the last administration have a detrimental effect? That's a, that's a great question from Dean. Uh, has it changed? I, I think it has, although the point that I always emphasize that there's always been this tension in Wisconsin history, as much as it is in American history in the way in which people of Mexican or Latino descent have, have found themselves at home in places like the state. Um, and so I would say the, the last presidency, the last four years was kind of a, a, uh, a an acceleration and it kind of put everything into a brighter spotlight. But what it really did was emphasize points and tensions that already existed for quite some time. Um, we only need to look, of course, at places like our dairy industry and, and the tensions that exist there and the labor that's needed of Mexican descent workers, often undocumented, but also this other strain in, in, in our state, which is to say people who are interested in criminalizing undocumented people and making it harder for them to live and to make a living for themselves in the state. Okay, I, I am not seeing any other questions, um, but we are just so thankful that you could join us tonight. And if people have additional questions, um, they can certainly put them in the comments section and we will check the comments section. Um, and uh, then we can let uh, folks know from, from there, we can reply in comments, of course, even after uh, we are done here this evening because uh, this will be airing on Facebook as a recorded post as well. Um, so people may have questions there. Thank you again so much for joining us on the Cinco de Mayo when we recorded this tonight. Um, and thank you again for writing this very important history for the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. I appreciate it. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. And again, my email is always open. If you got questions, you send them along my way. So thank you. Good night. Good night.